push it again, maybe. I was it saying, are you seeing it? I don't see it. In in bottom corner. Yeah. Keep going. It again. is. It mm -hmm. says it. Okay. Today is Wednesday, the nineteenth of May, two oh oh four. And my name is Newell Brian Tozer. And we're at the Atlanta History Center, and I am going to interview Colonel Nettles uh, for his memories of 30 years, a long time, 30 years in the Air Corps. Uh, would you give me your name and address, or your, just your name, Colonel Nettles, please, because you've just moved to Atlanta, I understand. Yeah. Well, welcome to Atlanta. <laughs> Thank you. Silas Simmons Nettles. Uh, I like I've just moved to oh, 404 Kingsbridge. In Atlanta. Atlanta. Mm -hmm. That's a retirement community. Yeah, isn't it? that's what it is. I hear it's very nice. It's real nice. Food's excellent. Well, you can't beat that. No, you no. can't. Now, tell me uh, how you happened to enter the Air Corps. Were you enlist? Did you enlist, or were you drafted, or what? Uh, the date is January 1942. January the 2nd. January 2nd. Uh, after uh, the Japs bombed, uh, bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, 41. That was 41. I entered in January 42. They uh, lowered the age limit from 21 to 18, and uh, I was 20 at the time, so I entered as an aviation cadet and went through flying school. You entered at age 20? Age 20, yeah. I was 21 on February the 14th, mm -hmm. and I was commissioned on February the 16th as a second lieutenant, and you had to be 21 to be commissioned. I see. I said, uh, where were you born? And tell me the date of birth and where you were born. Okay, 21422. 1922. 1922 in Montgomery, Alabama. So that's your home? That was where I was born and raised and went to school. All right, so all right, it's a wonderful town. So you uh, you enlisted? Uh, well, I, uh, I went in as an aviation cadet. Yeah. It was what they call where we uh, getting ready to go through flying school. Mm -hmm. That took a year going through flying school. Where was that? Well, I started at Maxwell Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. It was Maxwell Field then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spent pre-flight at Maxwell. Mm -hmm. And that was 60 days. Uh -huh. And then I went from there to uh, Dorfield, that's D-O-R-R, -R, in Arcadia, Florida, for primary training. And then I went to Bushfield in Augusta, Georgia, for basic training. And then I went to Moody Field in Valdosta, Georgia, for advanced training. Then I went to Smyrna, Tennessee for B-17 transition training. So all of that was one year or, yeah. or over a year? Well, it, it was just about a year. It was training. just about 12 months for that. And then after that I went to, uh, in Smyrna you got B-17 transition and then we went to what they call the phases. You had phase one, two, and three <coughs> that was uh, where you picked up your crew, your combat crew, and you did your gunnery training and your formation flying, and most of that took place in Walla Walla, Washington. That's a long way from Alabama. A long way from home. <laughs> so. Uh, that was basically the triumph 
flying end of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when we got into, we picked up our crew and uh, went overseas. Uh, I went to, uh, oh, we went into England and got in the 8th Air Force. By this time, it was 1943. 43, it was, that's right. Uh, because you I had, got I got shot down in October the fourteenth. Well, let's go back. Okay. Let's go back a little bit. So after over a year's training and all of these schools and getting your crew and Walla Walla Washington, yeah, mm -hmm. all that, you went to England. Yeah. Uh, with the Eighth uh, Air Force. Yeah. We went over on the boat. Mm -hmm. They took us, all our crew, we went over on the boat. Uh, and we docked in Northern England. I really don't know where. I reckon it was Ireland. But uh, we uh, docked there and then they put us on a train and uh, took us down to a place called Snetterton Heath. Uh, and it's where you picked up your all your flying gear and everything that you needed for combat. How many of you were there? Ten. ten well, on, on my crew, on ten. On your crew there were ten. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was your position? I was an aircraft commander. You were the commander mm -hmm. of this 8th Air Force. But, no, oh, I mean, of the, that airplane. Of that, that airplane. Crew, yeah. Did you have a name for the plane? Yeah, it was uh, the Bobcat. The Bobcat. Yeah, it, we named it after a good friend of mine was named Bob Hales. Mm -hmm. And uh, my girlfriend at the time was named Caddy. Uh huh. So I named it Bobcat. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, were you part of the 92nd Bomber Group? 96. 90, excuse me, 96 yeah. Bomber Group. Uh -huh. And uh, your plane, the Bobcat, was part of that Yeah. in the 8th Air Force. Mm -hmm. But the day I got shot out, I wasn't in my plane. Really? No, they sent uh, three crews of us had to go over to the 100th Group, which had been shot up bad three or four days before and they didn't have enough crews mm -hmm. to fly the airplane so they sent three crews of us over to the hundredth group and we took off and flew flew with them on that Schweinfurt mission. I see. Over Schweinfurt, Germany. Yeah. Well, let's go back a little bit though. Uh, had you flown several missions already with your plane with I the was, Bobcat? I was on my second mission. You, you were just on your second mission when yeah. you were shot down. Yeah. So you hadn't been in England very long. No. Well, I'd been in England uh, about two months. Mm -hmm. We got there. Well, I'd been there long. I got there on August the 20th mm -hmm. of 43, and I got shot down in October. So I had been there June, uh, June, August, September, and October. Well, a little while. Well, a few months. Yeah, a couple of months. But you had only been on one or two missions on the I Bobcat. I was on my second mission. So and so then you were loaned yeah, to the you were loaned to this other hundredth group. Hundredth group. Yeah, they had they they had more airplanes than they had crew. So <laughs> they sent. I believe it was three crews, might have been just two, I don't remember for sure, but I believe it was three crews put us in a truck and took us to the other air base and uh, we got in their airplane. I wasn't in mine the day I got shot down. I was in one of their. And were you captain of, of the plane you were in? I was aircraft commander. Commander yeah. of the plane you were in, it was a B-17? Yes ma'am. And there were about ten people in the crew. Ten, ten of us. Yeah. And and what was your objective? What what were you doing? Going to drop bombs? Yeah, we were going to we bomb in the ball bearing factory mm -hmm. in uh, Swineford. 
was our, that was our target. How do you spell Schweinfurt? I can't. You don't <laughs> I know. Wish S, I S C H or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's S C H. I don't. It ends in F U R T. F U R T. Schweinfurt, yeah, Germany. Schweinfurt, Germany. And and so, you were with the one hundredth group then. I, I flew that mission. I, I was actually in the ninety six, but, but that day I flew with the hundredth mm -hmm. group. And your plane was shot down. Over Schweinfurt. Well, no, about uh, I reckon ten or fifteen minutes after Schweinfurt, I got hit by flak anti-aircraft fire mm -hmm. over the target mm -hmm. when we dropping the bomb, and it knocked out my number four engine. And uh, then the once if I, I got behind my formation when I was trying to fell to the prop and get caught up and uh, the fighters hit me, the German fighters about, well it seemed like eight or ten, I really don't know how many it was. A lot. Uh, it was a lot of them and uh, <coughs> they shot down my other engine and uh, actually the right wing caught on fire and that's when I gave the order to bail out, which was about 15, 20 minutes after Swinefoot. And so you, you as the captain and the crew parachuted out? Yeah, mm -hmm. parachuted and uh, my, my parachute, I, I got in the Bombay, it's narrow. Uh, it's two big bombs hanging on both sides and you had to go through it, it was narrow. Well, I, after I gave the order to bail out, I went into the bomb bay myself and I had on what they call a chest pack. It's a little parachute right here on your chest. And uh, I, I couldn't get through the bomb bay, so I, the bomb bay door was closed back, so I couldn't see if the crew was out. So I unhooked my, my parachute and it was hanging down, I unhooked, there's two hooks on it, I unhooked one and let it down and I reached through the bomb bay to kick the door open mm -hmm. where I could see if the crew was out and when I did my handle that pulls your parachute out, it got caught somewhere and my parachute came out and was lying on the floor in the bomb bay. So I reached down and picked it up and wadded it all up in my arms like that mm -hmm. and then bailed out. And then I uh, was, when I was falling out, I started pulling my parachute out like that. And I looked up and it was what we called a streamer, which means it wasn't opening. And, uh -oh. uh, uh, well, it opened. Uh, that was the way it normally did. You know, you don't have any parachute practice jumping out of parachutes because it's a one-time deal. But uh, I looked up and it looked like it was a stream of which you thought it wasn't going to open. And about that time, it opened. And uh, thank heaven. It it opened and I was, you know, swinging back and forth and. Uh, I could uh, see down on the ground, I could see the Germans coming where I was going to land. Uh, I was at about, uh, I think, 14,000 feet when I jumped out. I believe we were about, we went over the target at 18, and I think I was at about 14 when I, I bailed out. That's quite high up. It was, yeah. It's, almost three miles. <laughs> no. Well, what happened when you landed uh, Well, they, when I landed, I landed right in the middle of a, I believe it was a wheat field, and I saw a corn field. Well, what, what happened, I broke my ankle when I landed. I, I either broke it when I jumped out, I might have hit it on the Bombay door, I'm not sure, because I didn't know it was broken until I hit the ground. I didn't, you know, I didn't even know it was hurting. And uh, so 
I could see the Germans running towards where I was going to land. And so I landed and I took my parachute off and I saw a cornfield about a hundred yards away and I started to run. Well, that's when I found out I couldn't run. My ankle was broken. So uh, the Germans came in and uh, there were two or three German men with pitchforks and there was one German lady that spoke English and she had a gun and she says you are now a prisoner of war if you try to escape I'll kill you and she wasn't kidding <laughs> I don't think but uh, then they that's when they captured me. The woman was the one with the gun. <laughs> with the one with the gun and the one that spoke English, mm -hmm. good English, so. Well, where were you taken after they captured you? I was taken into Swineford, the town we had just bombed, which was, wasn't too good, and was taken to the police station, and they put me in a cell. My, <laughs> my crew, we were all together. Uh, I wondered what happened to them. Yeah, we all ended up in Swineford. In, Every in the, one of them came through. Though. Yeah, all of well, my in, uh, engineer was wounded, mm -hmm. uh, but not serious, not not bad. Uh, all of us got out and lived to tell it. But uh, that's that was. So you would you were taken? The Germans took you to uh, a jail. Uh, uh, a civilian. You know, just like a city jail. Jail in Swineford. In Swineford. And put us in the jail there and kept us uh, there until about 2 o'clock in the morning. They came in and put us in a, a German truck, like a, uh, you know, just a bulk truck, a big had a canopy over it. Mm -hmm. And they took us uh, to the interrogation center in. Frankfurt, and uh, that's where we stayed and while they interrogated us, while the Germans did. What was the interrogation like? Uh, it, it was like we had been briefed. We had been briefed on what would happen to you mm -hmm. if you get shot down, and it followed that. They knew that exact. It happened. They started off by the first people that come in, they take you there with the Red Cross, and all they, they want your name, your rank, your home address, which you, all you can give is name, rank, and serial number. They ask for your home address, and you won't tell them that, and then they ask for, uh, you know, your mother's name, your father's name, brothers and sisters if you have them, and uh, then they... Uh, and are you supposed to tell them that or not? No, you're just supposed to tell them name, rank, and serial number. That's all? That's all you can tell them. And uh, that's all I told them was name, rank, and serial number. And uh, then they uh, keep you in there. And uh, uh, that night, we were in a, a, actually just a German jail, mm -hmm. and there was... Uh, about three crews, either two or three crews of us that had all been shot down at the same time. And uh, they put us all in a German truck and that's when they took us to Frankfurt. And that's, that's where we got, they fed us for the first time then because we were pretty hungry. I'm sure. And because uh, we hadn't eaten. Was any. it decent food? Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, the food was good then. Mm -hmm. It got bad sort of towards the end of the war in the prison camp, but uh, then it was good good food. And so then they, uh, after they get through interrogating you, they uh, take you to the prison camp, and that's where you meet a lot of old friends that you, <laughs> you thought were dead, believe it or not, because you saw one of them's airplane blow up and parachutes come out open and 
they counted parachutes. The tail gunner used to count parachutes. And uh, so you bumped into some friends that you thought were long gone. Well, that was good. Yeah, that was that was real good. By this time, it was, uh, what, 1943, February? No, no, this was October. This is October of 43. October the 14th. October the 14th of 43 mm -hmm. was when you were shot. That's was when I shot down. Okay. So it's it's October still when you get to the prison camp. Yeah, it's still the last of October. Last of October, 43. Yeah. Uh, and what? where was the prison camp that they took you to? It was uh, 60 kilometers straight south of Berlin. If you go straight south of Berlin, 60 clicks, you you get to a place called uh, Saigon, spelled the same way Saigon over in Vietnam was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, that was a little town of about, I think, five or six thousand people. It was just a little small German town. And was this was a big prison camp for officers or this for, was this was for officers. Officers flies. Flyers. Pilots. Specifically officers. Pilots and, and uh, officer crew members. It was all for officers. That's what I thought. Yeah. And did it have a name like Stalag or Aflag? Stalag Luft 3. Stalag Luft 3, 3 was the name of this prison the camp. Name of the camp. 60 kilometers south of Berlin. That's right. And how long were you there? 19 months. That's nearly two years. Almost two years. <laughs> That's a long time, Colonel Nelson. Yes. Yeah. They, uh, you know, they moved us out of there in January the 2nd of 45. And moved us down to Munich, mm -hmm. and that's where we were liberated. Patton came in and got us there, but that's where we were liberated. Patton's Third Army came in, and uh, we were at that time we went a camp with uh, the British, uh, Russians. Uh, we were all in one camp together. About how long were you there? Uh, about uh, 60 days, maybe a little longer, 70 days. Before Patton? Before Patton came Liberated in. you. Yeah. We could hear him coming, I mean, for three or four nights before we got liberated. We could hear the bombs and the cannons and the little arms fire and all. We could hear that come in. Mm -hmm. One thing sort of funny was, uh, Patton came in the camp, they had three jeeps, and one was in front, one in the back, and Patton was in the middle. And, you know, he was sort of a big, heavy guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came in the camp right after we were liberated, real, he was right up in the front. And he got up on the back of a jeep to talk to us, and when he started talking, he had a high-pitched voice. He didn't sound like a big, hard general, but uh, he it was real funny. He was. Uh, he told us that he was have food there for us within the next couple of hours, and uh, he did. They came in some GI trucks full of food, and we were hungry. We were good and hungry. The rations had gotten we, short. Gotten very real short. short yeah. And uh, the thing about it is uh, we thought we were, we were hungry, real hungry, yeah. but we couldn't eat much. No. We were used to that brown bread, and they brought white bread. White bread tastes like uh, uh, angel food cake mm -hmm. to us, because mm -hmm. all we had had was that German brown bread. Mm -hmm. And uh, But he got food into us uh, within about, I'd say, three hours. He had, had trucks coming in full of food boxes that we all... Bless General Patton. Yeah, that's Did right. Did you lose a lot of weight? Yeah, I, I went... Uh, when I got in the Air Force, I weighed 178 pounds. When I got out of the prison camp, I weighed 118. So I had lost about 60 bones. pounds. Yeah. You were just skin and bones. Right? Yeah. 
I got some pictures of it, but I didn't bring them. But well, I don't know where they are. If you want to know the truth, but uh, well, you just moved, and I hope you'll find them someday. Yeah, well, I'll find them. Did there. anything ever happen about your ankle? Did they ever set your ankle, or did you get it, any medical it, attention? No, they, I had to have it. Uh, they all they did in Germany was strap it, strap it up, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, when I got back, I had to have it rebroke and reset, and uh, they had a big cast on it for oh, I think about six, eight weeks, where they had to rebreak it and and set it. And now it works like a jewel. It's, That's wonderful. Yeah, uh, it's good. But the Germans gave you no medical attention, really. Not, not for that. No, they, you know, they couldn't take care of their own people much less trying to take care of us, so their medical supplies were short. About how many of you were in the prison camp where you spent so long, the one 60 miles <coughs> in, south of Berlin? In my camp, well, I was in Stalag through three. Now, there were one, two, three, four, five compounds mm -hmm. with about 2,000 each in each compound. I was in the south compound, and uh, that's where The Great Escape, you know, the yes. movie The Great Escape? Yes. I worked in that tunnel. You did? Yeah, I sure did. It was used for The Great Escape? Used for The Great Escape, yeah. And this was Stalag Loop 3? Three. 3. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us about that. Well, it was... Uh, if you had claustrophobia, you couldn't do it because you uh, uh, the tunnel was about three feet wide and maybe two feet high. And we had, believe it or not, we had uh, carts that could go down and carry the dirt back. And then we'd take the dirt and uh, we sold it in our pants. The Germans let us walk around the you know, the border of the prison mm -hmm. camp, huh. not outside, but inside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we put things in our pants and we ran a string up and we took the pocket out of your pants uh -huh. and we had it hemmed down at the bottom with little slits about that long mm -hmm. all the way around and you'd walk around the camp and pull that string and the sand would fall out. That's the way we got rid of the, the dirt. sand. But let me tell you, I don't know why the Germans, we raised the walk path where we walked around the camp. Mm -hmm. We raised it up about two feet. And it was a different color sand. It was sort of reddish where the other was brown on top. But the Germans never did the thing about it. They couldn't find the camp, the tunnel. Do you, and, does, do you think they noticed this different color of the dirt? Oh, oh yeah, they, they just couldn't the couldn't find the tunnel. They couldn't find it. See, we put it out about, I can't remember exactly, I want to say about 200 feet outside the wild. The, that's where we broke it open, which so it would be far enough you couldn't get shot or the Germans wouldn't see you when you got out. Mm -hmm. And that's where we broke, went straight up and broke it out. But uh, I worked on that tunnel. Digging? Yeah. And it, it, if you had claustrophobia, you couldn't get in there. Because it was so small. Yeah, it was small. I, I saw the movie, but it's been years ago. Long yeah. I can't remember. Did it work? It worked and people... Yeah, some, we, we got... Uh, some of you got out. We put... Uh, you know, I can't remember exactly now. Uh, I'd say we put about 26 or 27 people out. Now the Germans captured, I believe it was about 18 of them in Munich and shot them. The Gestapo caught them and they, they shot 18 of them. The others got back to the prison camp and were put in solitary confinement for a oh, couple of weeks, 10 days, something like that and then they came back in the camp. They were brought back to the camp? Mm-hmm. Germans brought us back. But 18 were shot? 18 were shot by the Gestapo in, in Munich. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I believe it was about 18. I, it's, you know, it's been a long time. I know, I know. <laughs> After that, you stopped digging, I think. Yeah, well, we did. Uh -huh. uh, we didn't break any more out. The, <coughs> you know, you're in the middle of Germany trying to travel. You couldn't. The only way you could travel was at night. And we couldn't get on a train, or you just had to walk. And the only way you could walk was at night, where they, you know, wouldn't recognize you. So, in the daytime you'd get in a ditch and try to rest or sleep. You couldn't sleep because it was cold. Did they punish those people or the whole camp in any other way, like cutting off rations or cutting back rations? Did no, they do they anything? Anything like that to punish you? No, they never cut rations off. They uh, uh, they punish the ones that escape. Like uh, they'd be put in solitary for you Two know weeks. eight to ten days, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing bad. The Germans uh, they live pretty close to the Geneva Convention. As you know, they couldn't feed their own people, much less us. So uh, it got pretty bad the last month or six weeks of the war. Did you receive Red Cross food parcels? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. They were a help, I know. Yeah, they they saved our life, especially towards the end. They brought them in from Switzerland in GI trucks. And that, that's what we lived off of, the, you know, right to up to the end of the war, because the Germans couldn't feed us at all. And uh, it got pretty hungry. So there. you attribute your life to the Red Cross food costs. Yeah, I mean, you they were good. So you were liberated by General Patton. That's right. And where were you taken after that? We went to uh, well. And were you still with your your crew? No, we were separated. Oh, because yeah. you were with the officers. Yeah, or? that's right. And uh, but the. Uh, what was I fixing to say? Where were you were taken after you were liberated? Okay, we were taken to uh, La Havre, France, mm -hmm. where we were. You had to, I didn't know it at the time. You told them how much you weighed when you got shot down, which, like I say, I weighed about 175, but I weighed about 120, 118 or something now. So they didn't tell you this, but you had to gain a certain percentage of your weight before they'd let you get on the boat to come home. Well, I, I didn't know that, but this friend of mine that was in Patton's army knew I was in a prison camp. He had gotten letters from home. He came in in a jeep and got me and took me to Paris. Well, in Paris, the air police had gone through the best section of Paris and moved the French people out and taking them over. Well, we had a wine cellar and we had good food. Well, I gained, uh, I reckon, a good bit of weight sitting there, waiting there for a couple of weeks and eating good mm -hmm. and uh, drinking good really? wine. <laughs> that helped. So when I got to uh, La Havre, France, where to get on the boat, then I had to gain a certain percentage of the weight. Well, I had already gained what you gain real quick. You'll gain a good bit real fast, and then it gets slow. Uh -huh. Well, I sat there, and people would come in and sign up and go out on the boat, and I'm still there. Finally, I went in and talked to the some major. I don't know who he was now, but uh, I told him, I said, people come in and out. And he looked at my record and he said, well, you've got to gain some more weight. And I said, well, how much do I have to gain? And he said, you got to gain a certain percentage. And I said, well, hell, I've gained that a long time ago. I said, I spent five or six days in Paris eating. eating. <laughs> so with that, I got on a boat the next day <coughs> and came, came home. Had your family heard from you? Yeah. When you we, were in prison, kind Yeah. Uh-huh. I wasn't married at the time. Uh -huh. And I, uh, 
you got these uh, POW letters and you could write uh, two a month. You could write two a month and they were, they were all, all blacked out when my mother got them. Uh, she censored. Yeah, they had been censored so you, could, you couldn't really tell much about them. Mm -hmm. But I still got those letters. Somewhere, I don't know where they'll, they are. They'll turn up. Yeah, they'll find out somewhere. But your mother received letters from you, and yeah. did you receive letters from her? Yeah, okay. yeah. I got uh, uh, quite a few letters we got in. Uh, uh, the mail came in spurts. We'd go for two or three months and not get any, and then one day we'd get a stack like that that you could take you a week to read, but you'd read them over and over. Of course. Yeah. And you'd have pictures from home, you know, they'd send pictures in. That kept you going. That kept you going, that's right. So, you got home in 1945, in mm -hmm. what, about August or something of 45? Yeah, August the 20th. August of 45. Yeah. You got home. And what after that, where did you go after you got home to Alabama? I mean, what, what after well, your went, homecoming? Well, I went to, to Montgomery and they gave us, we had uh, 90 days, what they called R&R, &R, mm -hmm. rest and recuperation. It didn't count as leave, that it was just R&R. &R. And, uh, and uh, then I, on the 1st of September, I got married. Married my high school sweetheart. Is this and uh, cat? What? Like, is this? You said your plane was named the Bobcat. Yeah. So yeah. And so this was cat. Uh, yeah, I married her. You married your high school sweetheart. Yeah, and uh, that's romantic. And let me see. Uh, and that was the first of September, of forty-five. Yeah, that was first of September, forty-five. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, let me see what we do then. Uh, let me see. I've got. You went to Montgomery, and then you had R and R, and you got married. Yeah. And uh, you decided to stay in the Air Force. Yeah. I, I, well, let me put it this way: I got out of the Air Force, but I stayed in the reserve mm -hmm. because uh, we got. Uh, $144 every quarter for being in the reserve and we needed the money. Mm -hmm. And so I stayed in the reserve, but then when Korea broke out, uh, then they, that's when I got recalled and came back in the service and spent the rest of the, my career in the service. So you were recalled uh, in about 50 Flying Cross. Yes, ma'am. The Air Medal. Yes, ma'am. 
five oak leaf clusters, yes, sir. well as a purple heart. Tell yeah. me uh, when you were awarded those and for what you were. Uh, well, the purple heart was uh, when I bailed out and broke my ankle. Mm -hmm. That was the purple heart. The DFC was uh, <coughs> everybody that was on the that swine, second swine foot mission, the one we lost 80 airplanes mm -hmm. on, got the DFC. That's how I got the DFC. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's that, air metal, you got that for uh, any time the commander would decide whether or not the mission was hard enough to deserve an air medal. Like if it was a short mission, right across the channel and drop your bombs and back, you didn't get an air medal. But if it was like going into Germany, they got you got a cluster for your air medal. So that's how you got those. <coughs> so the DFC was for Schweinfurt? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Everybody that was on that mission. 80 planes. Yeah. Colonel Nelts, do you still keep up with some of your old buddies? Oh yeah, we have a reunion. I have a reunion. It's called the Second Swinefold Memorial Association. Uh -huh. And we have a reunion every year. In fact, this year it's going to be in Swineford. We're going back to Swineford. Good. The Germans, uh, see they, they come to the anti-aircraft people uh -huh. that shot at us. We are real friendly with them, and so they are having us all over in the Swineford on October the 14th this year. Are you going? Yeah, I'm going. I'm so glad. I'm taking my son. Good. He and I are going. Good. I look forward to that. How long have you been including the Germans, or have they been in on these reunions? That's amazing that, to think that they are in on it now, the enemies. In. They've the been in on since the first one I went to. Now they had, had two or three before I went, but the first ones I went, the German people were there. And uh, in fact, the mayor of Swineford, she's, uh, she sponsors the whole thing. They feed us and they do everything when we go to Swineford. That's remarkable. Oh, it's, uh, Don't you it, think that's remarkable that yeah, the enemies they, are now friends? Yeah. And they have a bus that takes us everywhere, and they, they have a big banquet, and the mayor speaks, and uh, we have some of the anti-aircraft fighters that are there. It's real interesting, real interesting. It's remarkable. Yeah, it is. And a lot of your friends go. Yeah, a lot of them. It's about uh, the last one we had a hundred and. I think about 116, 117, and that's a good many. Yes, it is. Because it's been, you know, 60 years ago. That's now. right. Yeah. That's right. This is the 60th anniversary that's of DJ. Right. That's right. This was before that. That's right. Well, uh, let's go back. Uh, you didn't actually go to Korea? Uh, I flew in and out of Korea. I was a pilot. You were a pilot? Yeah, in Captain. military airlift command. Mm -hmm. And I cooked cargo in and troops in and out. But I was never stationed in uh, Vietnam well, or Korea, either one. All right. But I went in and out of both of them. Both places. Mm -hmm. And you were flying cargo? Mm -hmm. And troops. Cargo and troops. I was flying 124s. That was that big thing that the clamshell, the doors open up like that, uh -huh. big clamshell. Uh -huh. Were you the captain? Yeah, I was the aircraft commander. Mm -hmm. Commander. And, and uh, how many missions would you say you flew into Korea? Oh, <laughs> I don't. I don't have any idea. It, uh, A lot. Yeah, it was quite a few. Mm -hmm. I don't really know how many times because 
sometimes we'd go in and out twice in one day. We'd fly from Japan into Korea and then back to Japan and back again. We'd take two trips a day, especially in the summer when the days were long. So that was for several years? Yeah, well, for a couple of years. And uh, then came the Vietnam. Yeah. And tell us about that. Well, I, I was actually never stationed in Vietnam. Uh, I, like I say, I flew in and out like I did Korea. See, being in MAC, Military Airlift Command, you know, we flew troops and cargo in and out. Mm -hmm. So I was not stationed in Korea or in Vietnam, but I went in and out. And I have no idea. Flying how big planes. Yeah, C-124s. C-124s mm -hmm. with troops and cargo. And you would land those. Yeah, mm -hmm. we carried. We even carried uh, the 124 could carry two gasoline trucks like you see filling up mm -hmm. airplanes, you know, the gasoline truck. Mm -hmm. We could carry two of those in one 124. That big? Yeah. It was a big airplane. I had no idea it was that big. Yeah. It was, they called it Old Shaky. Because <laughs> it would, when you would take off, you would bump down the runway, uh -huh. and then after you took off and the gear came up, instead of bumping, you started, it shook like this, so they called it Old Shaky. Old Shaky, 124. 124. Must have been big. It was a big airplane. Uh-huh. And, and you were the captain. Yeah, I was the aircraft commander. Commander, you call him. What a career. Yeah, it was pretty good, pretty good. You have, did you say three children? Five. Five children, three daughters. That's three, right. four daughters, and four one, one child, so. one boy. All right. And lots of them live around Atlanta. Yeah, that's why I'm here. Three, three daughters Good. live in Atlanta, and one boy lives in Montgomery, and one daughter lives in Shreveport. I see. Good. Is your wife still alive? No, she died. Uh, it's been about a little over a year ago. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Well, you retired. Is, is it 1970 when you retired? Mm -hmm. From the Air Force, yeah. Uh -huh. As a colonel? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Did you double dip or do anything after that? Oh, yeah. I, I went to work for Times Mirror Corporation as a publishing company. We, they had a, a publishing company in Montgomery. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> they published cookbooks. Mm -hmm. And I went to work for them and worked uh, eight years for them. And I retired from there in, I believe it was 1978. Mm -hmm. I think that was it. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly had a distinguished and an amazing Air Force career, Colonel Nettles. I think you may be probably the only person we've interviewed out of 170 veterans who served in all three, yeah. World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. I'm the only one that had 30 years in the Air Force, evidently. I guess so. I guess so. That must be it. What what do you remember most about those years? Well, I tell you, it was a good time. I mean, I had a ball. My wife and I, we lived in, in Tripoli, North Africa. We lived in Germany. She was with you in Tripoli? Yeah. Oh, we, good. Yeah. Oh. We lived there three years. Mm -hmm. And that was delightful. I had an Arab houseboy that took care of me. She had an Italian maid that did all the cooking and uh, made noodles like, you know, you 
Sick. Like on a dining room table, she had popped the noodles mm -hmm. and then had a big pair of scissors that she cut them up and cook them. Oh, it was good eating. <laughs> Triplet was nice, real nice. Now, I lived right next door to Gaddafi. He lived right next door to me. Muammar Gaddafi? Yeah. And that was before he had taken over. He was just a captain in the uh, Libyan army mm -hmm. when he lived next door to me. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> he had a lot of pull because of, there'd always be two or three Mercedes sitting out in front of his house. And there'd always be two or three guards walking the street out in front and out behind his house. But that was before he had taken over as the head of Tripoli. So, but uh, I used to talk to him. He spoke English, but people didn't know that, and he'd never speak it on, on the air, on radio. How but did he, you find out that, find out that Muammar Gaddafi spoke English? He talked to me. We, I walked up and down the street with him. He'd walk up and down the, down the street, and uh, we'd stand there and talk to each other. His, his English was broken. I mean, it, you had to sort of understand him, because he didn't speak real good English, mm -hmm. but he could speak it. So you enjoyed Tripoli? Oh, it was nice, real nice. But they kicked us out. <laughs> and uh, I, I had already, we had already, my wife and I had already gone home. And uh, <clears throat> I came back over when they, when Gaddafi kicked us out. And I helped <coughs> airvac all the troops and uh, what cargo that we could get out of there. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what we did, it was sort of funny. Uh, we were getting ready to go. We'd gotten everybody out, and we were getting ready to leave. And it was uh, oh, Chappie James. Uh, you probably don't know who he is. He was a, a black uh, general mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, Army Air Corps. And uh, he and I were left there together. And uh, before we left, we looked over there in the corner, and. Uh, there were about 20 bags of cement. And so we got our troops. We had about, oh, about 40 or 50 men there with us. And we got them and we dumped all that uh, cement in the sewer and in their water. So we, when we left, Tripoli was running. We had messed up all the sewers and all the water. So when we we told them goodbye, <laughs> and we were gone. <laughs> Got out of there. Yeah, we were out. And then after that, you came back to, to the United States. Yeah, I came to Dover, Delaware. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And was that where you were when you retired in 70? No, I retired, uh, I actually retired at Maxwell. But, uh, Your home base, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, what happened, my daddy uh, had terminal cancer. And so uh, they sent me to Maxwell uh, and I was on a permanent change of duty station. So I was actually stationed at Maxwell when I retired. That's where I retired. <coughs> what memories? Yeah. What memories? <laughs> And I'm so glad you're going back to Swineford. Yeah, I'm going to go back. Is it October? October the 14th. All right. Yeah. Well, we're actually leaving the 12th and coming back on the 20th. So it'll be a nice trip. Good. With your son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'll mean a lot. Yeah, he's looking forward to it. To have him with you. Yeah, that'll be nice. Like I say, I got four girls and one boy. <laughs> well, of all the wartime memories, uh, which are the ones that you think about the most? Oh, the wartime? Mm -hmm. 
I reckon it's that prison camp. I think that's about it. That, uh, Nearly two years in prison. Yeah. I think more about that than I think of any other part. The rest of it was sort of easy. But those those memories are the ones that... They stick with you. And you'll be glad to be with those buddies. Oh yeah, we'll have a good time. Well, I, I mean, I'm amazed to hear about the great escape. And, yeah. Uh, your whole career is just distinguished. That was nice. Well, we appreciate it oh, yeah. so much. Is there anything else that uh, you'd like to tell me, tell us before? I can't think of anything. Uh, you know. Is there anything that your buddy here knows that uh, <laughs> we should know about? I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> well, 30 years of a distinguished career and we are very, very grateful to you for coming and talking to us, Colonel Nettles. Thank you so much. Well, I'm glad to do it. Enjoy talking to you. Thank you. I enjoyed it myself. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Francis. How'd it go, Chief? Thank you. Fascinating. Went real good. Good. Let me see what we do here. Uh-huh. I think this I is where she turned it on. Uh-huh. I think this is where she turned it on.